Also, as you hear, we'll be recording today's talk so that others who are unable to join will be able to listen to this online and also that you can listen so that you can listen afterwards too. Um, so just briefly, the purpose of the Transitions Talk seminar series is to place the research that we do as transition scholars into a broader context. And we try to do this by inviting new perspectives on innovation and sustainability. Um, we involve different actors from civil society and also from other, other kind of places in society in a speaker and panel style format, often centered around a specific societal challenge or social, socio-ecological concern or technological concern. Um, and in, in doing this, what we try to do is essentially learn about how we can think and collaborate in new and possibly meaningful ways in response to the challenges of our time. Um, within this talk, we try to provide an opportunity to, to hear these perspectives, to reflect, uh, and also to network amongst others who share this interest. Um, for those of you who have joined for the first time, this is part of the Transition Talks series. Um, this is the first talk that we'll have in 2021 with a specific focus on food systems and the interrelatedness of food systems, particularly in an urban context. And um, if you're interested in the talks that we have had in the past, please feel free to, to check the page that we have on Chalmers, the Transition Talks page, where we outline these other, the other series that have occurred. Um, so today we have with us Emily Norford as a keynote speaker. Uh, Emily is Implementation Manager uh, in EAT, and EAT is an international science-based nonprofit that's committed to food systems transformations. Thanks so much for joining us, Emily. Super excited to hear, to hear the perspective that you'll bring in today and to learn from your experiences. Uh, we also have uh, Eric Andre, who's a municipal PhD student, uh, connected to physical resource theory at Chalmers and also connected to Gothenburg municipality. And we have with us also Anna Wienquist, who's a professor in the University of Gothenburg and Saul Grenske Academy at the Department of Internal Medicine and Clinical Nutrition. As you can see on this slide, we have a three-part format for today's seminar. Firstly, we'll have Emily, who will provide a keynote presentation, and Emily will share her experiences with us from the Shifting Urban Diets Initiative, which is based in Copenhagen. And it takes an integrated and holistic approach to food systems transformations in an urban context. And then after that, we'll have 20 minutes of panel reflections where Eric and Anna will be invited to share their perspectives and also to engage in a dialogue with Emily together. And that will, that will um, continue until 12.45. And then for the final 15 minutes, we'll have a bit of an open format where we welcome questions from the audience or reflections, um, and we can bring these in to a conversation with either Emily, Eric, Anna, or all three. Uh, so that's the format for today. Very quickly before I pass over to you, Emily, I just want to mention that for participants, please, it would be great if you could ensure that your microphone is muted and that your video is turned off so as not to disrupt others in the call. Um, whenever we, if, if you would like, sorry, if you would like to um, either provide reflections or comments alongside the presentation, please feel free to do that in the chat function in the Zoom call. And also for the final 15 minutes, we'll have a more active engagement with that function too. Uh, if you ask a question, we can either read this question on your behalf or you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and to turn on your video and ask the question yourself. Uh, we'll have our videos on as speakers, facilitators and panelists throughout the call. And as you heard at the beginning, the call is also the this um, uh, transition talk is also being recorded. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to pass over to you, Emily. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. You have around 20 minutes to share your experiences with us with us. Um, Good luck. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction, Gavin, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. So I'll just pull up my screen sharing now. Can all of you see my slide? Thumbs up. Great. Um, so my name is Emily Norfert, and I manage EAT's portfolio of cities, urban food systems based projects. I've been at EAT for about five years, and I have a background in environmental studies and sustainability science. And today I'll speak with you mostly about one of our initiatives called Shifting Urban Diets, which is aiming to make healthy and sustainable food the default in cities. This project focuses on Copenhagen, um, but I'll get into a little bit of background on what EAT is as an organization, what types of work we do with cities, and how this Copenhagen project can have broader relevance. So I assume most of you are generally familiar with kind of the global challenges we're facing today. 
climate change, um, biodiversity loss, health problems, especially now with COVID. And Eat firmly believes that transforming the global food system is a key way to reach a number of our global goals, um, to achieve the sustainable development goals, to achieve the Paris Agreement. Uh, so it's really crucial that we work on this food systems transformation in a holistic and systems-based way. EAT is a fairly small, fairly young nonprofit based in Oslo, Norway. And we work at the intersection of science, business, policy, and civil society uh, to transform the food system, looking at food from both a climate and health perspective. So taking this really integrated approach. We also work uh, in several different ways. Um, you can see at the bottom of the screen here, uh, we have different approaches based on generating knowledge, engaging these different types of stakeholders in kind of unconventional and impactful ways, and also translating this knowledge and engagement into action. And I think our Shifting Urban Diets initiative is kind of a good example of how we're bringing together all three. So EAT has recognized that transforming the global food system is really crucial for achieving global sustainability and health related goals. In 2019, a report was released by the EAT Lancet Commission on Food Planet Health that sets the boundaries for a healthy diet from a sustainable food production system. And this was kind of groundbreaking. <laughs> it was based on scientific synthesis research and it's it resulted in this Eat Lancet Planetary Health Plate, which is pictured on the screen. And you can see with this plate, um, ideally people eat around half fruits and vegetables, a smaller amount of whole grains, a smaller amount of plant sourced protein, and then really minimal amounts of animal sourced foods. So we're not saying the whole world has to go vegan in order to fix climate change, but really minimize animal sourced foods and increase uptake of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. And this is something that can be applied to any type of geographical or cultural um, context. When this report was released in 2019, it, it got a lot of uh, global media attention. So there's some pictures of that here as well. And it's really become the scientific evidence base for EAT's work. So we have the science, but then how do we make the impact? And one of the channels that EAT really focuses on and that um, the work that I do is related to is transforming urban food systems. We see cities as a really important change agent. Uh, as you probably know, over half of the global population lives in cities, and this is projected to grow. By 2050, around 80% of all food produced in the world will be consumed in urban areas. Uh, and cities are really big hubs for resources um, and consumption and waste. Moreover, municipal governments are often kind of more closely connected to their constituents and the citizens and are in a position to make more rapid and impactful change than national level governments. So cities can be really impactful and they can move quickly and have an impact. And EAT's work with cities is focused on translating kind of the global level synthesis science into local level action. We have a number of different projects seeking to do this in different ways. There's the Shifting Urban Diets Initiative, which I'll spend most of my presentation talking about. We also partner with C40, which is a global network of cities working to address climate change on a dedicated food systems network. We're part of several different kind of large EU projects looking at urban food systems trans, um, transformation from a citizen-driven innovation perspective in the Food Shift project, and from an integrated food policy and food strategy perspective in the Food Trails project. Uh, we also have collaborated with UNICEF on children eating well um, in urban contexts, and we've been involved with the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, um, particularly the annual Milan Pact Awards program. So Shifting Urban Diets is, um, I think, the project that's kind of most EAT-led and EAT-directed and the most direct example we have of translating science on healthy diets from sustainable food systems to the city level. We're aiming to make healthy and sustainable food the default for people living in cities. So the first thing people go to because it's convenient, it's appealing, it's accessible. Um, 
And we're focusing the, uh, the project on Copenhagen as a pilot. And the intention is that although the methods and approaches we're developing this project, um, well, that the content of these methods and approaches is specific to Copenhagen, the methods and approaches themselves have the potential to be adapted and replicated and scaled to other cities. So each leading this project, um, but our partners include the city of Copenhagen, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, the University of Copenhagen, the World Resources Institute, and an urban planning and design firm called GEL. The project has uh, kind of four main areas that are all being worked on simultaneously. First, uh, we're working to establish a science-based target for Copenhagen's food system focused on the greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, we're working more with kind of local residents and people in the city themselves to understand and transform neighborhood food environments to improve uptake of healthy and sustainable food. And alongside that, we're working with public kitchens in the municipality to reshape their menus to better align with the Eat Lancet planetary health diet while still being reflective of the local context. And then pulling all of these three approaches together, uh, we're working to identify the learnings, the insights, and the methods that can be applied in other city contexts. Um, so working to disseminate these results and approaches to cities around the world. So I'll talk through each of these briefly, um, and then hopefully there's time to get through them all and pull them together. Uh, so with the science-based target, uh, don't worry too much about understanding everything in this graph, but it's um, we've approached this from a few different perspectives, and we see this as a really innovative thing because as far as we in this project know, uh, no one else is really establishing city-level science-based targets for food. And using the Eat Lancet kind of boundary for the greenhouse gas allocation from the global food system as a basis, uh, our partners in this work have been combining kind of a top-down multi-regional input output analysis approach with a more bottom-up life cycle analysis approach using several different types of data sources, both at the national level and at the municipal procurement level, and mapping out uh, what is the baseline for the greenhouse gas emissions of Copenhagen's food system, and what would a kind of reasonable uh, plan or target be for Copenhagen's food system. And just drawing your attention to a couple things on this graph. Um, the lines at the top and the left-hand side are different ways we've um, conceptualized the baseline for Copenhagen's uh, food-related greenhouse gas emissions. And then the long lines at the bottom, the blue line and the purple line, are two different ways to set the science-based target. Um, the purple line that goes all the way across the bottom of the screen is if you did a kind of equal per capita allocation. Um, so looking at the Eat Lancet's boundary for the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that the global food system can emit, and then just dividing it by the number of people in the world and multiplying that by the population of Copenhagen. So that's a more straightforward way to do it. But then the bottom line, the blue one, is taking a development rights approach. So recognizing that maybe since Copenhagen is from a part of the world that has emitted a lot more historically, there needs to be an even greater reduction now for it to be fair. Um, so we've mapped these out and then the dotted lines show kind of the current trajectory that Copenhagen's food system is on with a business as usual approach. And you can see that their emissions are reducing and um, that's due to a number of changes the municipality has made with organic procurement, um, which is really fascinating, but maybe not time to get into detail with that now. Um, I can talk about it later. But the green dotted line is um, how much difference it would make if everyone in Copenhagen adopted the Eat Lancet planetary health diet. So you can see that by shifting to an Eat Lancet diet, um, the city gets a lot closer to achieving the targets. And essentially when we're looking at what can be replicable in this or applied in other contexts, um, there are three main elements in this that I've just described. So it's establishing a baseline for the emissions related to a city's food system. It's determining the allocation for that city um, from the planetary boundary. And then it's understanding what impact would it have if everyone in the city switched to an eat lancet more plant-based diet. 
but then that's a little bit um, high level and not something that kind of individual citizens experience or care about so much. So to complement that and to try to really apply um, approaches that can help the city achieve this target in a very kind of tangible way, uh, we've been doing some work led by Gail on understanding and reshaping neighborhood level food environments. So the food environment is really kind of the physical, social, or economic interface where people interact directly with the food system. And it can be what foods you're exposed to, um, where you buy food, where you eat food, et cetera. And to better understand this, we've selected kind of two different case study neighborhoods in Copenhagen and done a series of analyses. One of the first studies we did was led by the City University of London, and they did a kind of photo voice inspired study with a focus group of residents in one of these Copenhagen neighborhoods. So the residents, it was a group of around 11 people, I think, were given cameras and some basic photography training um, and told to go out and document the way they interact with food in their everyday life. And every week or so they were reconvened for a workshop um, and a discussion. Um, and this whole thing went on for about a month. And these photos here are some of the results. So understanding how people in this neighborhood experienced food, what they noticed, um, and also their suggestions for how the food environment could be improved. And these results helped inform the work that we did um, to create food environment prototypes later on in the Shifting Urban Diets project. So you can see, for example, uh, someone noted that uh, cigarettes and tobacco is kind of hidden behind screens at the checkout counter. Maybe something similar could be done for junk food and then you don't just buy something on impulse because you walk past it and it's displayed very prominently in the store. Someone else noted that um, organic tomatoes look really appealing, but the price prevents them from buying these tomatoes. So what's considered healthy food is too expensive. Someone else made an interesting point about food trucks where they thought there could be better access for healthy foods in the way of food trucks. And maybe if you're getting a food truck license, you should be required to include or prioritize some healthy and sustainable options. Uh, and also maybe food trucks should be spread out throughout residential neighborhoods as well and not only concentrated in tourist hubs. And then another example that was really relevant for the work we took forward was the potential of kind of underused public space. And this person um, did a little illustration in their photo of a pop-up market that could be um, set up near a metro station and uh, transport hubs where people walk and pass by anyway, that could be used to make healthy food more accessible and appealing. At the same time, in a parallel process, our partners, Gail, the urban planning and design firm, conducted a bunch of surveys and studies to really narrow in on a specific target group of residents within these neighborhoods and develop and implement um, a prototype to see how we can transform the food environment. And their research indicated that focusing on youth ages 12 to 16 would be really interesting uh, because these people are at an age where they're old enough to start leaving the school premise during the school day um, for the first time on their own. And they're becoming a little bit more independent and hanging out in the city with their friends more. And we found that uh, these students often hang out in grocery stores or fast food joints. Often they go to grocery stores multiple times a day <laughs> during the school day. And this is partly because they feel welcome in these places. It's kind of often with fast food joints, there's a place to sit and hang out with your friends. Um, in the supermarkets, there's not really a pressure to buy anything. You can just walk around looking. Um, there are also really cheap food options available, which suits their budgets. Um, so over the summer, uh, there was a kind of participatory design process with these young people to help them really create the type of setting they want where they can hang out and it's an alternative to hanging out in grocery stores and um, fast food restaurants. So you can see a few photos here where they were really invited to um, visually show what they would find inspiring in an urban neighborhood. And after these prototypes were implemented, there was another follow-up um, a picture on the right side here um, to get a sense of how they reacted. 
And these prototypes essentially included three different components. They were implemented in each of the case study neighborhoods. And they were using public space that was close to both a school and close to a supermarket. So one of the components was um, installing kind of pop-up furniture and edible gardens. So it provided a really appealing, engaging place for people to hang out and also feel a little bit more connected to growing things and maybe think about food. Um, and this is temporary, so it was easier to get a kind of permit from the municipality to implement this. Um, then another element was introduced, which was a food truck in each location offering uh, subsidized planetary health diet meals. So making the food really accessible, affordable, and cool and appealing. And then a third element was that um, the supermarkets in each of these areas put planetary health diet deals on a special offer. Um, so one of the supermarkets kind of changed the composition of their prepared meals to be aligned with the Eat Lancet recommendations. So through all of these things, um, a lot of data was collected. And right now in the project, we're evaluating the data and trying to see what impact each of these three elements had on kind of reshaping the way people in the neighborhoods engaged with food. And also how these interventions can help take the city closer to meeting the science-based target. Then the third element in the project uh, was reshaping public kitchens. And in this specific instance in the project, uh, we worked with four school kitchens and these schools are kind of unique in Copenhagen. They're called food schools and the students in the schools um, are directly engaged throughout the school year in working in the kitchens and the canteen and preparing lunches for the whole school. Um, so throughout this work, we've done a kind of mapping of how the status quo aligns or not with the Eat Lancet recommendations. Um, Chefs together with the students developed kind of a set of menus centered around local seasonal Danish ingredients. Um, so some of them are presented, presented here, um, probably familiar in the Swedish context as well, where a lot of you are based. And one of the cool things with this was that um, the students themselves from these schools prepared these menus and served them at a big global um, summit, um, a C40 summit. So mayors and city officials from around the world who are working on sustainability and climate came to Copenhagen for the summit and they got to eat the local healthy sustainable meals um, aligned with the Eat Lancet recommendations prepared by the students themselves. So that was kind of cool. Um, but beyond that, we've been conducting training programs with the public kitchen staff to help them incorporate even more of the Eat Lancet recommendations um, focused right now on alternative proteins and sustainable seafood, which also aligns with the municipality of Copenhagen's kind of broader municipal goals. So throughout all of these um, processes, the process to establish a science-based target for a city's food system, the process to understand and then influence a local food environment, and the process to understand how a menu is matching against the Lancet recommendations and then make it even more aligned while still being appealing and uh, something people want to eat. These are all things we're working now to kind of synthesize and package and disseminate. So we've had some workshops with other city networks um, where we've kind of presented the project to them at its different stages over the last couple of years. And now in 2021, which is the last form formal year of the project, um, our big focus will be on distilling these three different approaches into kind of toolkits and guidelines that can be made publicly available. Um, and we'll work with some other cities to understand how these guidelines can best help them achieve their own food related ambitions. So since I think most of you are uh, it's a Nordic heavy audience, <laughs> we had a workshop in November with a cohort of Nordic cities um, who seem quite similar to Copenhagen in a lot of ways um, and are also quite ambitious with urban food systems transformation. And we've been identifying um, either kind of this whole package of approaches could be used in a city or if a city just wants the guidelines and how to transform public meals, they could pick up on that work or understanding how to set a baseline and a target, they could pick up on that. So we're seeing this as a kind of flexible modular approach and hoping it will have kind of broader relevance beyond just Copenhagen. And that's it for me. Um, I guess hopefully I've kept to time. I'll stop sharing my screen now and then we can go over to the, the panel.
Thanks so much, Emily. Uh, and thank you also for trying to make that connection between kind of the higher level ambitions of, of something like the planetary boundaries right down to the city level in Copenhagen and also even the, the district level. I thought that was super interesting. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'd like to move over and invite Anna Vinkus to, to kind of introduce a little bit about yourself and maybe share with us some of the work that you've been doing also on the topics of food and health. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gavin. And thank you, Emily, for a really interesting presentation. Uh, and as you said, Gavin, my angle on this is that I'm a professor in nutrition here at University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, I'm also a guest professor in sustainable health at Umeå University. Uh, so my research focuses both in the arena of public health and also on clinical intervention trials on an individual level. And since a few years ago, I've also added the sustainability perspective. And I'd just like to share a few slides to make my points. So, so this is a report that you mentioned, Emily, that of course is, uh, was groundbreaking when it came 2019 and a big step forward and where it's really a common ground for all of us. And what it did, as you said, was that it defined a planetary health diet. And this is from the report showing the changes that need to be made between the current diet and what this is the sustainable diet. <clears throat> and this is the figure showing North America. Um, the planetary health diet is not very different from all existing international and even Nordic nutrition recommendations. The biggest difference perhaps being that it's a major difference in how much red meat you're allowed to consume. And we can see that in North America currently the consumption is about six times larger than the planetary boundaries. So we need to cut back on red meat, which is a big thing in the, in the planetary health diet. We also need to reduce the intake of egg, of poultry, and of dairy foods. So the big challenge for us in the field of nutrition is how do you make people change their habits? How do you make people make nutritious choices? Is it through strong recommendations? Is it pricing? Is it nudging? Is it food labeling? Or the example that you, Emily, shared with us that the whole city takes a big take on making the right choices accessible. So that's a big challenge for all of us in the nutrition field today. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll just share a few slides from the work that I'm engaged in. Uh, we are a research group from University of Gothenburg, UM University and Research Institute Sweden, RISE. And currently we're working with data from the Vesterbotten Intervention Program. It's a population-based study where we have dietary intake data on individual level of about 100,000 adults. And using that data, we can look at the reported dietary intake and we can calculate the dietary climate impact. And we have linked it also to national registers of mortality and morbidity. So we could look at actual health effects. So these are results that were Anastrid is the main author. So what we did with this data for the 50,000 men and women is that based on the reported dietary intake, we could evaluate that in relation to the Nordic nutrition recommendations and classify them into the 50% who have the highest nutrition or uh, uh, diet. And we could have the 50% who have the lowest diet quality. And based on life cycle assessment, we could also look at the greenhouse gas emissions and classify them into the 50% with the highest climate impact and the 50% with the lowest. So then everybody could be classified into the four quadrants. And of course, this is where we don't want people to be in the future, where you have a low quality diet with a high climate impact. And given how these men and women were classified into these four quadrants. We then looked at the expected um, risk of mortality given the real data. So just quickly what we found for women, again, we have the reference group being those who had the low diet quality and a high climate impact. Compared to these women who were placed in this quadrant, the 50% of all these women who actually reported a high quality dietary intake, oops, what we noticed was that they had, both groups here had a lower risk of dying. This is the hazard ratio or risk of dying within the coming 15, 20 years that was significant. So this means that it is, it was among the women in Umeå, in, in Vesterbotten, it was possible to identify a diet that had a high nutrition quality, a low climate impact, and actually a significantly lower risk of dying. And this was, these women were characterized by having a high intake of 
low fat dairy. They had a lot of fruit and vegetables and uh, also cereals. For men, it wasn't that easy to see the patterns. Um, those men who have the high nutritious intake didn't have a significant different risk of dying compared to the reference group. What we saw about that men in this group with a low diet quality and high climate impact were characterized by a high intake of red meat, poultry, high fat dairy. Those that stayed within the low dietary quality, but at the same time had a low climate impact were characterized by a high intake of sweet drinks and sugar. Of course, those food items have a low climate impact, but are not associated with good health. And we see that there's a significant increased risk of dying if you belong to that group. So the take home message for us working with these data is that it's possible to identify food patterns that are both nutritious, low climate impact and associated with longevity. That seemed to be possible among women. Men did not have that clear pattern. And it's obvious that we need to help people make these choices. What do we do with these uh, such uh, food items like sweet drinks and, and sugar? So given that, my thoughts about the presentation, Emily, I, I have some thoughts coming from my angle. Um, the Eat Lancet diet, of course, as, as you said, is, is just an average diet that should be adjusted to the local context and different groups. And if I understand correctly, you focused on the youth in Copenhagen in your different projects. So I'm just curious, have you made adjustments from, from the planetary boundaries? And I'm thinking about this with a, the low intake of red meat, for instance, where there are some issues perhaps among growing adolescents. Um, what are the expectations in your project um, in terms of acceptance? We know that coming from the nutrition field, it's hard to get everybody to accept low intake of red meat, for example. And how do you in your project look upon these food groups that are not really addressed in the Eat Lancet diet, the sweet drinks, sugar, alcohol, that we know from national reports that perhaps as much as 20% of caloric intake in Nordic countries may come from this group. And I'm just curious about your outcomes of the project. Uh, will you evaluate adherence to the Eat Lancet diet? Will you look at the planetary boundaries or, or what are the key outcomes? So I'm not sure if we have time to look at all these questions, but these were my thoughts looking at your very interesting presentation. So I'll stop here to give room for also Erik and I'll, I can come back to my issues later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, super interesting research also. And as, as you mentioned, some kind of provocative and, and curious questions posed at the end. Uh, Eric, I think we'll pass over to you. Um, we might have a little bit less time to engage between the three of you, as I think we're a few minutes, uh, a few minutes behind. But I think we can return to some of the questions, Anna, that, that you posed, and also those of you in the audience, if you'd like to take up those and also comment on them. You're more than welcome to do so too, or as are you, Emily, too. But over to you, to you Eric. Um, Eric thank Andre. You. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'll try to be effective with time. Uh, I don't have any slides. Uh, I thought I'd um, try to just talk and uh, connect my research and my work uh, to, to um, your presentation, Emily. And uh, just a short introduction of myself. I'm a municipal PhD. Uh, candidate and uh, so I'm, I'm employed by the city of Gothenburg and half time I do my PhD studies at Chalmers and I do my research within a research program that's called uh, Mistra Sustainable Consumption. Uh, it's a collaboration between several universities, uh, Chalmers, Karolinska, uh, KTH and so forth. And we look at um, sustainable consumption in uh, within three uh, areas, and that's food, obviously, and uh, home decoration, and um, uh, traveling or vacationing. So, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Emily. It was really, really interesting, both uh, for my work as uh, an environmental in investigator at the city and uh, for my work as a researcher. Uh, I, I'll, I, um, I thought about these three points that you, uh, these three areas that you talked about, science-based targets and neighborhoods and, uh, and public kitchens. And uh, I have some thoughts on all of them. And the first one is science-based targets. 
we are uh, in my work at uh, the city of Gothenburg. We are now developing a new program for climate and uh, environment. So we are setting new targets for for greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions, among other environment issues. And uh, normally I work with climate generally, but uh, within this uh, with work with this program, I've looked at the um, targets specifically for for. Um, our food consumption uh, pub from uh, public meals. So we tried to set a target there and uh, I wish we ha would have had access to your work before we set a target, but uh, I don't know how our targets, which haven't been decided yet, it has to be decided by the politicians, but uh, probably it will be somewhere around 1.3 kilos uh, of uh, carbon uh, uh, equivalents uh, per kilo of uh, food. I think it's uh, along the lines of um, uh, eat Lancet. Uh, at least it's, uh, I think it's at, uh, along the lines of uh, um, the, this, um, what's, what is it called? Planet, uh, one, uh, one Planet Plate from World Life uh, Foundation. Uh, and uh, what else? Yeah, so I'll move on to, to the secondary about neighborhoods and improving food environments. And that's, I mean, the, re, uh, the focus of my research is how local policy for um, sustainable food consumption. And I'm not that much focusing on the things that you were talking about here, uh, how we can improve food environments in order to uh, facilitate a more, a more sustainable food consumption. But I think it's super interesting. And uh, uh, down the line, I, I hope I can look uh, into this too. And uh, it's also interesting, really interesting uh, for the city of Gothenburg. And we're starting uh, to work now with a new program or a new plan for, for uh, uh, food provisioning or, or food, the food system within Gothenburg city. So this is really interesting and I will definitely recommend my colleagues that are working on this new uh, program or plan to, to look at your work. Uh, there was something that was, uh, I had a question there also. You, you said that um, you talked about supermarkets and uh, how they could have um, uh, deals on the healthy and sustainable uh, food. And uh, I was curious on how you col uh, collaborate with these uh, supermarkets, how you make them have these deals, what's in it for them? Uh, because it's not, at least in Sweden, it's not something that you can regulate as a municipality, but you have to have some kind of col collaboration, I think. So that's, that's really interesting if you could say something about that uh, later on, Emily. Uh, but the other examples you had, they were really interesting also. And uh, I think my colleagues will be interested in hearing about those. And the third area was public kitchens. And now we're getting closer to the main area or main focus for my research, um, because what I'm interested in is school meals. And uh, the reason for that is that um, this is something where the municipality really has a strong mandate. Uh, since most uh, pupils in elementary school and high school in Sweden, they attend uh, public schools and they are run by the municipalities. And it's mandatory for, uh, for uh, all schools in Sweden to serve uh, school meals free of charge to all pupils. Uh, I think it's only in Sweden and Estonia and Finland that that's the case, even though there are school meal programs uh, throughout the world. Uh, and so here you really have um, uh, strong mandates as a municipality to do something to, to try to foster sustainable and healthy uh, diets. And uh, that's because you, I mean, you have more or less all uh, children uh, and you reach them for uh, 10 years of their life when they are shaping their habits and, and their food habits. And that's something that uh, you have a potential to impact their food habits. Uh, throughout their life, and both outside of school when they're in school, and after school when they've uh, when they finish school, and throughout their life. Uh, and of course, this has been recognized by many people, and uh, it's a common argument when you uh, uh, try to uh, make new policy regarding school meals. Uh, you see often in the news that uh, they introduce uh, vegetarian days, uh, two days a week, or maybe fully vegetarian menus. But you also see about protests against that from children, from uh, teachers, and from uh, parents, and and uh, public uh, pol political parties, and so forth. Uh, so what I am interested in: how can we uh, 
make uh, these kind of changes with the school meals uh, that uh, are accepted and uh, that actually can shape uh, the food habits of uh, pupils outside of school, that uh, they feel that this is something for them. Uh, so right now I'm working on a project. I'm fortunate enough to um, work with uh, some researchers in uh, at Karolinska, Patricia Eustachio Colombo and uh, Liselotte Schaefer Linder uh, with colleagues. They have de developed a tool which is called Optimat, uh, with which you can optimize um, menus for both uh, climate and nutrition. Uh, so what you do, basically do is that you take the previous menu and you take all the, uh, let's say, a menu for four weeks or 10 weeks or something like that that you have at school. And then you um, uh, take all the foods that are on that menu in the recipes and the amounts of each uh, food stuff. And you run it through an algorithm and you get a new uh, virtual pantry or virtual fridge with with uh, with new amounts of all of these food stuff you don't take any food stuff away and you don't add any new so if there is beef uh, in any of the uh, recipes uh, in the previous menu there will be beef but probably less beef uh, in in the optimized virtual pantry and and from that you make a new menu and they've tried this at some schools in, in Bochirka and, uh, and uh, Uppsala, and they, uh, they um, decreased the uh, climate impact by 40%. And uh, they uh, retrieved, or they had the same nutritional quality, uh, and they also decreased costs by 11%. So that's what we're going to try now in some new schools, and we're going to add uh, hum communication and see how that affects the acceptance of, uh, of a, such a new menu. And, and yeah, I forgot to mention that when they tried this in Butchirk and Uppsala, the acceptance of the new menu was as good as the acceptance of the previous menu. So I think I uh, overshot my time there, but uh, it's hard. Uh, we had only a few minutes, but uh, thanks again, Emily and uh, Anna. Really interesting to listen to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, Anna and Emily. Um, we have overshot the time a lot. So I think first we should give Emily at least two, three minutes to react to the thoughts that uh, she heard from Anna and Eric. And then we will somehow try to mix the, the discussion and questions from the audience and try to hear all of you at least once more. Um, yeah, but Emily, go ahead and try to keep it short. Great. Um, thanks very much, Anna and Eric. It was very interesting insights from your own work and also good questions. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be quick. I don't know if I'll get through all of the points you made, but uh, I think both of you mentioned something related to acceptance. So is, is our hope that this will be accepted? How do we get the kids in the schools to accept the changes in the menus? So maybe I'll start with that one. And one of the things that's been really interesting working with these uh, food schools in Copenhagen is that the students are really actively involved in reshaping the menus. Um, I should also note that we didn't do any specific work in this project to um, adjust the Eat Lancet reference diet for different sectors or age groups, um, nor did the project scope include um, kind of alcohol consumption, which hopefully isn't an issue for youth anyway, but um, sugary drinks are the things that are, I guess sugary drinks are part of the Eat Lancet um, sugar intake, but we didn't go beyond the scope of the Eat Lancet reference diet and we didn't make any specific adjustments for different groups. However, in working to reshape the public kitchens and the school meals, um, of course, we were trying to comply with the Eat Lancet diet to the extent possible, but also we had to comply with the um, Danish nutritional recommendations um, and kind of the guidelines that the school kitchens have to abide by, which is um, also ensuring that the right meal composition is prepared for the right age group and the types of students who are eating it. But one way that worked really well with acceptance is involving the kids themselves in developing the menus and preparing the foods. And uh, in general, the way Copenhagen works in these types of food schools is that the chefs from the kitchens uh, speak closely with the students. And if they're introducing a new ingredient that's maybe a little bit out of the norm, 
they introduce it gradually in kind of small quantities. They let the students taste it. They have a discussion with them. What's it like? How do you cook with it? Um, so it's not catching the students by surprise. And then when the students themselves are part of preparing the meals, they feel a sense of ownership and pride and they're more interested in actually eating the meals. Um, so that's been one way to kind of increase the acceptance of these meals. Um, but that's a huge focus for the, the municipality of Copenhagen are the ones leading that work package and um, making sure that the meals and the changes will be accepted by the kids is a, a really, really important um, priority for them. Um, just looking at another question, uh, how to collaborate with the supermarkets. That was tricky. Um, our partners, Gell, the urban planning firm in Copenhagen, were um, mainly leading that collaboration since they were the ones kind of on the ground in these different case study neighborhoods. And um, of course, it's something that the municipality themselves can't control or regulate, but um, researchers from Gale went to speak directly with the individ individual supermarket managers and explain what this project was about and what they were trying to test. And eventually, um, the supermarkets, it seemed, hadn't thought so much about kind of a planetary health diet um, or the climate and sustainability and health impact being all linked together. And um, the changes that they made in their prepared meals or their promotion items was temporary. So it could also, it was also kind of an interesting thing for the supermarket to collect data on and see if, if people found those meals more appealing than what they were usually offering. Um, and because it was temporary, it wasn't so much of a big commitment. Uh, but the, both supermarkets um, thought the project was really cool and they wanted to be more involved. And I guess in the future, it could also be something that could be good publicity for a supermarket if they're doing something appealing and sustainable. Um, I don't know, I think I talked for more than <laughs> three minutes. So um, maybe I'll just wrap up by saying with the outcomes of the project that we're hoping to see, uh, the scope of the project was to define and test and implement these different approaches um, for establishing the target and the food environments and the public kitchens. So kind of measuring um, compliance or change over time is unfortunately beyond the scope of the project that we have, although we very much hope that the city of Copenhagen will continue with this um, and that we will be able to see a difference in their greenhouse gas emissions associated with food. Uh, and in the future, we're really focused on bringing these approaches to other cities, um, but then also, I think with the, tar with the target especially, there's a lot of potential to see how to establish a science-based target for other planetary boundaries. So moving beyond just the greenhouse gas emissions one, um, but we're not there yet. Thank you, Emily. I think probably you could speak another 20 minutes uh, just referring back to the questions asked. And I would love to hear the discussion between the three of you. Um, but I will pick up the first question from the audience, which is what do you think of school gardens as an inspiration tool for kids to improve the interest in food? And the person who asked the question hasn't specified who should answer. So I think actually you could look at this both from a project perspective, from a policy or a nutrition perspective. Uh, so maybe I will give this first to Anna. Uh, how would you think of this in terms of, um, yeah, raising the interest yeah. from a... Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure that Emily and Eric have more to say from their angles, but absolutely. And I, I think that some schools are really working with this, but absolutely. And I, I think, like you said, Emily, involving the, the students themselves, that makes a huge difference. Maybe Eric. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember because I recently was a part of authoring a, a report on um, policies policies for sustainable uh, food consumption, and I remember that we have something on this in in this report, but I can't remember actually what the conclusion was. But I I think it was. Uh, it had been tried because we looked, uh, I mean, it had been investigated in a few papers that we looked on and, and I think they were positive uh, regarding it, but I, I don't remember any details, but I could, I could post the link to the report if you want to. Sure, that would be very interesting. Be free to do that, Eric. Okay, um, we only have nine minutes left. So to allow for more questions, uh, raise your hand or 
turn your camera on so we can see if someone wants to ask a question from the audience. To raise the digital hand, you click on the reactions button. We have a sign from Katka Czerna. Hi. Yeah. Um, I have a question connected to, so connected to the gardens actually, because so far, um, I mean, the kind of evidence is piling why it's good to have gardens, why it's good to have communal gardens how much uh, like positive effects we can have both on food literacy but also uh, some sort of overall well-being but then on the other hand we cannot really see this overall like we cannot see it on some sort of bigger scale so i wonder what are the challenges of implementing something like this in the first place and like why hasn't it, why it hasn't been just uh, kind of implemented overall or in some bigger scale The question is also to uh, whoever feels that they can contribute something. Okay, uh, um, I, I can say one thing uh, to the last question you asked, uh, uh, and why isn't it uh, implemented more? And uh, mm -hmm. I think, and uh, now I'm speaking uh, maybe more as a civil servant, uh, I think it's a matter of, uh, at least in Sweden, that uh, well pressed budgets for the schools mm. Just, uh, i mean they they don't have a lot of resources then and, and they uh, feel pressed on on uh, how they should use their resources i think that's one issue at least mm -hmm. and i also know that among teachers and and uh, staff working at uh, schools that they feel that they are being asked by uh, the government and and uh, different organizations that they should address all kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, ranging from food and sustainability and, and uh, violence among kids and, and uh, everything should be solved in, in the schools. So they, I think they are a bit pressed like that. But I think it's really interesting with school gardens and, and, and we have a few in Gothenburg City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to add on a tiny bit, um, I, I don't know, or I'm not an expert on kind of what's preventing these from being taken up more um, in the Scandinavian context. So I think Eric, your points on that were really interesting or made a lot of sense. Um, but I think also it's just, it's a little bit uh, trickier also with the climate and growing season here with school gardens. And we've seen some cities in other parts of the world. Um, this is a much bigger part of the way they operate and not just around schools, but uh, Quezon City in the Philippines has a really robust kind of urban farming, urban agriculture, community garden initiative that's also been a big uh, way that they've coped with the COVID pandemic. Um, but then, um, so it's possible and there's some examples to learn from from other regions. But I agree, it seems like it hasn't caught on so much um, here, likely due to some of the challenges that Eric raised. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Miska, for the question and for the reaction to it. Um, we have also a question from Bahare, who wonders about, and I think this is a question for Emily, um, the packaging and the use of plastic. If you look at that and if there is an initiative to reduce the plastic use. Yeah, that's something that, um, to be honest, has been a little bit outside of the scope of what this project has focused on, but that's a really important point. And, um, EAT was not directly the ones working with the local supermarkets um, or the food trucks in Copenhagen, but I did see in a photo that the um, supermarket prepared meals were still packaged in plastic. So even though the food itself was much healthier and more sustainable, the packaging was not. Um, so I think that's a, a very important thing to address. And um, if we were to do this in the future or something to kind of add a criteria for the supermarkets also weren't initially part of the scope of the project, but then we saw an opportunity, so we went for it. But um, focusing on packaging is a really important thing to keep in mind as well. Thank you. And then we have uh, Lennart who wants to ask another question. Are you, do you want to put the camera or your audio? Yes. Hello. Yeah, I was the guy asking the question about school gardens. But it was just a comment on that because uh, I'm also a politician here in UMU and I'm having a suggestion for that. And the school garden was actually 
supposed to be a collaboration between the elderly people close to the school, together with the school kids, in a way to keep the budgets low also. So that was the, what my comments just, but we had problem in the commune municipal, they, they didn't, they only saw problems with it what land they're going to use and things like that. But the suggestion was to use boxes, obviously. Make it simple and easy, yeah. So yes, thank you for the talks also. Very inspiring. Cheers. Thank you, Leonard, for this very interesting comment. We have two minutes left and I see that Francis has some last question and then I will wrap it up. You're muted, we can't hear you. All these different places to mute. Um, I would just be curious from Emily, given that we're a university that is organizing this and we have re and researchers involved, if you have any thoughts of like what research you would want to see that you think is missing and that would be really important um, for the future work of like an organization or your projects? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess there are a number of different research angles that could be useful going forward. And one would be um, getting a better sense of the type of uh, indicators and metrics to measure how a city is progressing um, towards achieving these targets. Uh, we've been working with, um, yeah, with the science-based targets part of the project, uh, looking at different types of data sources, but I think more work needs to be done on um, how different cities with different types of data available can make sure they have the right data in place to do these types of analyses. Also applying kind of targets or boundaries to different elements that are not just climate, but how do you measure how a city is doing in terms of achieving the health goals of the planetary health diet or um, staying within the biodiversity planetary boundary or the land use change boundary. Um, so I think applying targets to different planetary boundaries is one thing that would be really interesting to kind of expand this in the future. Um, and then also just practically um, developing better tools to enable cities to measure how they're making progress towards the targets through these different types of interventions. So those are a couple of areas at least. Thank you, Francis, Thank you. for your question. Thank you, Emily. Thanks again to Anna and Eric and Gavin and Shal, who are my uh, co-organizers. Um, yeah, I think this was a super interesting transitions talk and it really showed how complex transitions are. And now we looked only at the health, food, climate nexus and that already opened up to 20 new perspectives. Uh, possibly. Um, but I think it's also a very good example where we saw different levels of theoretical and uh, yeah, practical application. So in this sense, I think it was a very constructive transition talk. I hope that we brought some uh, people together who have probably not been talking to each other before. And I thank you all. I wish you good afternoon. And um, you can find the recording on the website and we will also share some interesting links and yeah, information that we have on this topic. So thank you very much and enjoy the sunny day. Thanks for joining. Thank you for the talks. Thank you, everyone.